the next learning objective is overlaying and overlaying can be applied to vector as well as raster uh, type data sets so overlay operation combines uh, spatial and attribute data from two or more layers and it creates a new layer and the corresponding attribute data for example here layer A and layer B are overlaid to each other and the third layer includes information from both of the layers so it includes the spatial information which are the shapes as well as it combines the attribute table to create a new attribute table for the overlay uh, one thing that has to be uh, is required is that the two input layers must have the spa same uh, spatial reference so it should have the same datum and coordinate system otherwise the overlay for the output cannot be determined accurately moreover if we are dealing with raster overlay uh, the two images or two raster data sets also should have their cells snapped to each other in other words they should be matched um, and their res resolution should be matched as well so it, here is an example where cell one uh, layer one and layer two are of different resolution and even different orientation so in this case an overlay cannot be performed uh, in the current condition these data sets can be um, processed to bring to a form where an overlay operation can be performed. So let's look at a raster overlay. Um, we have a 3x3 three three raster overlaid with another 3x3 three three raster. The first one is a soil type and the second one is land cover. We have two soil types in this area and three land covers. Now if all of these land covers and soil types were present, then as ma and if all of these different combinations occur, we can get as many as six different types of situations um, where each soil type can occur with each one of these land covers. Uh, but in reality, it, all of the possible com combinations rarely occur. Um, but when we overlay, what we, ba what we basically do is we concatenate the IDs of the cells. So A and 2 becomes A2. B and 3 becomes B3. So um, in the output layer, we will have both the soil and the land cover inf information combined in the ID. And likewise, the attribute table will be created based upon that. So we have... Um, a, A1, A2, B1, and B3. Those are the only four combinations that occur and we have the land cover information as well as the soil information for that. So this way we have taken two separate raster layers and combined them into an output layer which is an overlay of those two. Likewise we can do the same thing for vector overlay. So suppose we have um, two vector data sets uh, and we overlay them again we have uh, in this case all the possible combinations may occur so we have two polygons here one and two and similarly two polygons one and two here the outcome will be four polygons after intersecting these two together so in our attribute table we'll have four rows and each row will contain both the class and the cost information that came from the two input um, uh, vector data sets. And hopefully this makes sense um, in both contexts, raster and vector. Now when we are dealing with uh, vector overlay, we have another things to be, thing to be, be careful about. We could have a point data overlaid with line um, or, or polygon or a line data overlaid with polygon. So what happened in that case? Uh, one set of rule that you can always remember is that the output will always be the, 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 the data set with the lower dimension. So if we are overlaying point and polygon, the output will be point. If it's line and polygon, the output, output will be line. If it's polygon and polygon, of course, the output will be polygon. Um, here's an example to elaborate why it is important suppose we have input 
data of polygons, which is county, and we have some points that represent some class at those given points. If we overlay polygon with point, if we expect the output to be polygon, then a new attribute of class will be created in the attribute table. But there are three classes. Which one will you assign to this polygon? So it's hard uh, to determine that. It's impossible. And so this output is not even possible. On the other hand, if the output is polygon, uh, uh, the output is points, then all you do is we take this attribute table and we uh, include two more attributes with it, which include the county information, which is the same in this case for all of these points. But there could be scenarios where there were multiple polygons and different attributes will be picked up based upon which polygon this point falls in. There are three ways an overlay can happen, clipping, intersection, and union. So clipping is simply cutting the region for the clip feature. If I have this input and this is my second input as a clip feature, then everything within this clip feature is output, everything outside is deleted. Um, in case of intersection, um, we intersect the two and the output um, will, will result in features from both of the data sets but only the features that are common to both or area that is common to both. In case of union, um, everything will show up in the output. So a triangle and ellipse, ellipse and triangle both show up and their intersection part is also identified. If this was intersection, only this little triangle with curved bottom will be the output. Let's look at examples for the for, for all of these cases. So suppose I have uh, catchments and I want to intersect them with counties. So I will overlay the catchments with the counties, which is with this dark line. And now I clip my catchment with these counties. And whatever catchments are inside these counties will be the output. Note that no county information has been transferred to the output because it is a clipping operation of the catchments only and the county information is only used to determine where to clip. Now if we were doing intersection that wouldn't be the case. In case of intersection all of these lines are intersecting with the catchments and wherever they intersect new polygons are being created and they, these polygons include the information about the catchment and the corresponding county. But the intersection only limits to the areas that are common to the two inputs. Anything that is not common is erased. The only difference between intersection and union is that in case, of, in case of union, these surrounding areas are also included as well as the areas that were intersected. So union has more uh, scope or larger output than intersection. And I hope, look at these three examples to make sure that you understand the difference between uh, clipping, intersection, and union. Now these can be used to perform erase operation as well, um, which is basically clipping but the complement of clipping. So if I want to erase everything between in, in this counties map that is overlaid by this catchment, then I can erase everything that is under the catchment and keep everything outside. So it's, it's kind of the opposite, uh, the, the reverse clipping. Uh, it is still clipping but the outside of the, uh, the region is preserved and inside is clipped. So now um, let's talk about some of the problems that can occur. One of the common problem in overlaying is slivers. If we take two data sets that don't have a very clear and uh, matching boundary, what will happen, the boundary will have different overlapping scenarios and these little polygons will be created wherever the boundary doesn't match exactly. And these polygons will become part of your output. So one way to remove these uh, uh, these little polygons called slivers is we go to the attribute table, we set up a threshold 
that tell me where are the polygons that are smaller than this particular threshold area and then we delete all of those entries from the attribute table. It's a common problem but easy to solve. Now let's look at an example to kind of wrap up the spatial analysis of overlaying. Suppose we have um, wind speed map and census map and we are trying to find locations where we, where we can do some wind farming and you are given two conditions that we can only put wind farm where the winds are high speed which is larger than four meter per second and it's a low population density area less than 10 people per square kilometer and you're supposed to take these two data sets and find these suitable sites for wind farming so how would you do before you go before you carry on take a moment and think about what tools and what techniques of spatial analysis that you have learned in this module you can apply. So first of all, let's look at the wind speed. We are interested in high, spin, high speed winds. So we can reclassify our wind speed where we call, we, we, we convert these five classes into only two classes called low and high. Low means less than four meters per second high means greater than 4 meters per second or equal to. And this reclassification process will identify areas where we have high winds. We are only interested in knowing if the wind is high or larger than 4, not exact value larger than 4. So now we are interested in knowing the second part of it, where is low population density? And the same technique will be applied, reclassify. And in this case, we have these dark areas that are sparsely populated areas and suitable for wind farming. But not all sparsely areas are suitable for wind farming because we have to look at the wind speed as well. So what, is, what would be the next step? Well, the next step will be to, um, again, overlay them and reclassify using the Boolean operator. So Boolean operator will be the wind is greater than wind is high and population density is low that would create a suitable area and everything else will be else will be low suitable suitable area and by doing that we overlay select and reclassify to get our site selection map and now you can see that the site selection map shows um, some areas here on the land and even in the ocean there are a lot of suitable areas where wind farming can be done